of Classroom Infobesity, but I wanted to let you know that uh, I would appreciate your thoughts and prayers. I'm taking my comprehensive exams tomorrow, and I've been studying off and on all day today. I'm ready for a break, trust me. But also, um, I also uh, wanted to let you know that uh, in essence that um, as I look at just uh, comprehensive exams, if you have any thoughts or pearls to share, um, I've studied my brains out, I'm excited, and I've really learned and grown a lot in my doctoral journey. So I want to encourage any of you who are watching this, if you've got your master's and you're wondering if you want to take that next step, I want to tell you it's been two years, that's been an incredible commitment, but at the same time, um, I've really grown as an educator and I thought I was good. I've really grown and you know, we can always never stop improving as a nurse educator. So I just want to encourage you if I give you that gentle push, uh, I'm looking forward to crossing the finish line, hopefully soon. So next week, I hope you have a good report and we'll let you know where things are at. Uh, we're at eight o'clock tonight and I want to apologize for bouncing around. And finally, we've, we're, we have found our sweet spot and I want you to know that as long as you show up, I'm going to be here Thursday evenings at eight o'clock. And I'm and so put that on your calendar, and I'll continue to send out reminders. Um, if you're not already uh, getting my on, on my Facebook page, Keith RN, think like a nurse. If you are, if if you like that page, you'll automatically get updates and notifications. And so, I just want you to be aware of that. And wanted to let you know, I got an email from an educator that really encouraged me that I hope it kind of speaks to you as well. And the things that I'm talking about, decreasing classroom content load, infobesity, really are foundational because we have to make time for active learning or we're not going to rock it. We're not going to prepare our students for practice in that context. And so here's what she said. And tell me if this resonates with where some of you are at right now. She said, I'm having to rewrite and cut lots of info from my course, cutting eight hours of lecture in a seven week course. What you shared last week was helpful in identifying what and how to cut the info. I'm a knowledge junkie. I want all the background. I want the deep dive on everything. So that is how I've designed my courses. You've certainly helped me understand that the most important content is getting lost in the overload of all the info I've been giving them. I also want to say thank you for all you do and have provided for nurse educators. You make us feel valued and you make us feel like what we do and how we do is vital. And you know what? That's my passion. Keith RN is not about Keith. It's about serving your needs and recognizing that behind every, every good nurse in practice, there is a nurse educator who taught and trained them well. And it's my passion to provide you all with the tools and the strategies to again, strengthen your teaching and all that you do. And so it's really, a, it's my pleasure and truly my privilege to do what I'm doing, to take a break from my comprehensive studying exams and come to you tonight. So thank you again for showing up. Um, I wanna briefly highlight, for those of you that did not catch parts one and two, again, in the last one and two weeks, Again, go to Facebook, uh, Keith RN, Think Like a Nurse. Those are recorded. They're there on the video link on the far left. But I want to briefly highlight it just very concisely, just to get us up to speed and to dovetail and kind of scaffold where we've been and where we're going. In part one, I talked about we need to have some broad brush strokes of how we approach our classroom content. And again, we wanna bring practice back into our classroom very practically. And so we wanna remember that we're teaching first year generalists and what is most common to a first year generalist, not a specialist. And that there's only so much load the cortex can handle at a given time. That science of learning theory is called cognitive load. And really we wanna have a mantra a repeated saying that I want you to look at everything you do, deep learning of what is most important and most common to first year generalists. Then in part two, last week, I shared, I, I got really practical and I want you to go back to last week because there's a lot of information, but what I in essence highlighted was 
about nine to 10 constructs of really what you want to include in a practice-based lecture. And there is an intentionality to them. There is a sequencing. There is a scaffolding of knowledge that builds upon each other. It's kind of like a domino. And so I'm just going to briefly go over those 10 really quickly. But you start with a story and you provide that context with your story. You then talk about pathophys, laying that foundation, the manifestations of that problem, the lab values that go with it, the medical management, pharmacology. And if you'll notice that those principles, physiology is the linchpin where everything else begins to fall. You know, when you understand the patho of the problem or the concept that you're teaching, the relevant lab values, what is most important of those labs begins to make sense. And so what we as educators must do, and what I just learned today as I reviewed my informatics content, is the, is, is, is the foundation of knowledge theory that really communicates very clearly and kind of puts context to this, that we need to, in essence, organize our classroom content in a way that makes sense to practice so our students can understand it. Otherwise, it's just all of the shotgun. It's a shotgun of information you're giving them. But when you provide it in this sequence, and again, it's kind of my approach to, as I look at practice and how I organize as a, from, a, from, a, from, a, from a clinician, as well as a newer nurse educator, the bottom line is we can bring that, that's, we can bring that, that, that organization that is practice-based, not content-based. And there's a difference because the textbooks doesn't, does not organize it for us in this manner. And we need to do that. And so then we talk about the priority body systems, the nursing plan of care, the worst comp possible complication, what to look for, et cetera. Please go back to last week if you hadn't seen it. And I'm going to share today um, kind of what I'm excited to do is to share an educator who has been following me in my journey. Her name is Paula Belknap. And she is at the University of Wyoming. And our paths crossed at a conference about seven years ago. And I've shared my strategies, case studies, and other things at conferences and workshops. Paula grabbed a hold of it. And she grabbed a hold of this concept of a practice-based lecture. And she, in essence, is, gave me consent to share what she did. Because what Paula did, you know, you're saying, oh, Keith, this is all, you know, kind of like, you know, Pollyannish. You know, can you really cut the content to about 15 to 20 slides for any topic or concept that you're teaching? And I want you to know that Paula cut the content and she brought an 82 slide deck from the textbook down to 13 slides. And so I'm just going to, in essence, today, I'm really excited because I'm going to just show you how it can be done. And, 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 and if Paula can do it, and what I'm going to share with you concisely with her PowerPoint, you can do it as well. And um, I just want to highlight, you know, Paula really quickly. She's been teaching for 15 years. She's immersed in practice. She recently began to cut back about a year and a half ago. But last year, she was awarded the Wyoming Innovations and in Teaching Award by the Wyoming Department of Education. So well done, Paula, and uh, for really your commitment to excellence and for sharing this, uh, sharing your PowerPoint with us tonight. And you know what? This is not just any PowerPoint. This is basically one of the most difficult content areas that anybody can teach. Anybody love immunity and inflammation? Well, this is on the concept of immunity. And when I was a new educator, guess who got stuck with that content? The very first year. <laughs> and I didn't have, and you know what? I didn't have this in my head at the time as a brand newbie. I was kind of learning on the fly. But the bottom line is, is that, um, if you can do immunity in 13, 15 slides, you can do any content in 13 to 15 slides. So let's go ahead and let's dig in to the concept of immunity. And what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna share my screen and I hope it all goes well, technology can be glitchy, but we're going to share my screen and uh, gonna basically kind of just, uh, gonna go full screen with PowerPoint. So I, I apologize, I'm not, we're gonna just maybe 10 minutes and then I'm gonna come back and we'll, 
close it out and kind of synthesize some of the takeaways that we can do um, with this actual demonstration. So let me just share my screen here and I'm gonna just, uh, just like a Zoom meeting, we are going to go there and let's see, I've got that and I am going to go full screen and from the current slides. So you should be seen, I'm gonna go backwards one, this is your title. This doesn't count towards your 15, by the way. Um, so it's the concept of immunity on HIV and AIDS. And so I put some things in red here, but you know, pa these are Paula's learning outcomes. Now these are in your syllabi. One of the things that I did to Paula's outcomes that I just wanted to highlight that I'd encourage you all to do is that if we're going to implement needed change in nursing education by emphasizing the understanding of essential content, we need to institutionalize it. And what I mean by that, we need to put the, we have to rewrite our learning outcomes slightly differently. And in this context, what I did, I took a couple of Paula's outcomes, described the path of HIV AIDS. That's a great outcome in your own words. Let your students synthesize and put the content that you're teaching them. Describe the ideology of HIV AIDS in your own words. Just a principle that I would like you to kind of, as we understand the importance of understanding essential content, our students, if they memorize it, but don't understand it, they have lost the ability to critically think. And that's in the nursing literature. So therefore we have to emphasize understanding of in our SLOs and to make sure that they reflect that so our students are held accountable to a higher standard of knowledge, which is understanding that content. So again, you start with your outcomes, say this is why we're talking about this today. And Paula starts with pathophys, just like the just like the outline. And there's a lot of information here. We can go through this. I'm not going to teach this. I want to use this as an exemplar just like a good conceptual based case study is an exemplar. But I want you to look at, at, at the causes. She starts talking about HIV and talking about how it infects CD4 cells. Now your students are gonna say, what are CD4 scale cells? And we need to go back to, well, they're T lymphocytes. And the T lymphocytes, let's just pull it out of them. You see, this is where in our classroom, ask questions. Don't just regurgitate this information. Now there's a lot here, even on this one slide. And Paula said that in about thir the 13 slides took her about 25 minutes with questions and feedback. So again, our goal is 20. If we can go no higher than 30, we're doing well. And again, no more than 15 to 20 slides because of the time it takes to go through. We're just highlighting the information for students because they have a textbook they should be reading. They have a patho textbook, a lab value textbook, a farm textbook. We want them to go to the resources. We don't have to reteach this content, even though it's essential. We are kind of beginning to shine a light on what is most important. Again, deep knowledge of what's most important. We're taking that textbook with numerous pages on HIV and distilling it to what is most important. So we, ask, we talk about the lymphatic system. We talk about lymphocytes. We talk then about the CD4 cells. And we just can briefly highlight what we want with our pathophys. We now go into the most important lab values. And what Paula did here, uh, I, I highlighted in red, page 492 in your textbook. I have a great question for you all who are watching this tonight. Do you reference your textbook? by putting the page number? I didn't as a new educator and I wish I did. So Paula, I, I think that we've got to get our students to dig into the textbook because you can only say so much in 20 minutes, no more than 30. We're just highlighting for our students. So let's highlight again, textbook page numbers. And as you can see, Paula identified all of the essential labs relevant to immunity with HIV, talking about the ELISA, the HIV viral loads, identifying in a CBC which labs are most important. Looking at the nutritional labs, this is a great question to ask your students. Again, ask the questions, why is albumin a nutritional lab? 
Now they think of it as just part of an LFT, a liver function test. Um, the bottom line is, you know, as, as we all know, you need to have protein in order to have a plasma protein, which albumin represents. Where does protein come from? You got to have a good food source. So again, ask the questions, draw out this information. Don't just say, oh, nutritional labs, albumin. If they don't know why albumin is relevant or why a lymphocyte is relevant to HIV versus a neutrophil, what's the difference between the neutrophils and lymphocytes? This is a great time to see what your students really remember from pathophys that are really important to nursing practice. So now Paula goes into the next phase of clinical manifestations, saying that in early HIV, there could be none. But then looking at the infections, the opportunistic infections, and what that looks like. And what I would do when you get to AIDS and general malice, why are you having these symptoms? Why do you have a fever? What does a fever and, and night sweats represent? That's true with tuberculosis. It's true with HIV. What's the understanding? Why? What's the inflammatory response doing to raise the temperature and cause chills? Again, that's the deeper knowledge we want our students to acquire. And what you noticed at the very bottom that I like that Paula did here, I highlighted in red, don't just give your students any website, give them the best websites. CDC.gov is different than Wikipedia to get relevant information on whatever your topic is. So again, ask the why as it relates to your manifestations. And now you've got the priority nursing assessments. You're gonna look at you know, the observation of the patient, the interview, the psychosocial assessment, looking at the physical exam and different body systems. And again, you can kind of pull out here what is most important and then essentially highlight it and ask the why questions. Why would you assess lymph nodes? Are they gonna be enlarged? Why are they enlarged? Where are they located? The most, the most easiest to access. So again, you know, we're not taking for granted and just giving them information. We're in essence interacting, engaging, even in a concise lecture. Now we get to pharmacology. Boy, HIV and, and medications. You know, again, HIV is out there. I haven't seen a lot of patients with this problem, but, but they definitely, I see a lot of these medications because we're, we're, they're living much longer, which is a good thing. But again, these medications have some high level mech of action. And so we can highlight briefly the mechanism of action of these medications and discuss the ones that are most commonly used in practice. So again, we have lots of meds here, but then we could bring it back and say, in this, in this geographic area, what are care providers using most often? And that can, again, brings a context to your curriculum and to your content and other aspects to look at. You can also discuss combination ther therapies and other aspects related to the regimen. Talk about non-pharmacologic therapy and what that looks like. Talk about the lifespan, you know, looking at lifespan considerations with, you know, the different ages of HIV, whether you're a younger adult, middle-aged or older adult. And again, always bringing in uh, those aspects of the older adults, especially because the complications tend to be higher. Then looking at the nursing priorities and plan of care. And you know what Paula did here? She gave them all textbook numbers. Let's get our textbooks out. Let's look at that. And what are you identifying and why is that a priority? What is the implementation, the planning, et cetera? And again, going to a relevant website, goals of care and what that looks like. And now we talk about Jason, uh, which is my metaphor from Friday the 13th of the worst possible complications. And so now we're talking about some of the things that HIV, you know, doesn't kill a patient where the HIV cripples the immune system. So they get all of these opportunistic infections and PCP, I do believe was one of the earliest uh, infections uh, of HIV patients that was very rare, but became very common in the question why. Well, that's how HIV and AIDS became discovered back in the early 80s, I do believe. And so again, she's provided textbook numbers though. So again, we can't cover it all, but we can direct our students to the source. 
which is our med surge textbook that they paid for and should be using consistently throughout the program. And then talking about evaluation, expected outcomes and education, and just highlighting what that looks like when, a, when the patient is managed well, and then looking at secondary interventions and what that looks like. And so as you look at that, um, you know, Paula used after she presented this, you know, the textbook has a lot of short little cases or little paragraphs, and she had her students go to that, as well as I have an HIV skinny reasoning on KeithRN.com that she used and found that to be a helpful tool as well. And so I'm just going to kind of just throw it out there. I'm just going to kind of stop sharing here and go back to my uh, go back to uh, to everything right here, and let's see if I can um, get back to where I want to be with you all. And uh, hang on just a moment here. I'll, I'll enable my camera. I hope I'm back right where I should be. Please let me know that you can see me and that everything is good here. Um, but, uh, you know, as you look at this, um, you know, as, 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 as you look, what is, you know, what takeaways do you have? Now, again, you know, you can change, you know, my structure isn't in essence set in cement. You can, in essence, make it your own because some content is not going to be system-based, could be leadership, could be, you know, um, a delegation, other concepts or content, and even fundamentals tends to be a little lighter on some of the pathophys and other principles. But, you know, my goal is that you, know, you could have some takeaways to look at with this. And I'd like to know what are some practical takeaways that you have? I'm just kind of scrolling down here. Uh, to see what you've gotten. And as you look at this, what questions do you have to kind of move your content in this direction of a practice-based lecture? Now, one of the things that Paula did that I'm going to share with you here, I'm just going to, um, um, as we look at this, I got one other thing I wanted to show you. So I'm going to throw something out there that might be, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go back uh, to share in my screen because I want to share one document that I've developed that is inside. Um, let me just find it here. There we go. I'm going to share this. And we're going to go one more time for one other document because what I want you to see is that I have developed a very practical Word document inside my membership for nurse educators at thinklikeanurse.co. And what it is is a Word document. And what I what educators can do with this is two things. You can, in essence, identify these categories that I've already shared with you. Um, and, and, and looking at your textbook, reorganize your lecture. So as you look at a textbook, a textbook does not go in this order. You need to, in essence, basically skip around but I want you to follow the essence of this order because it's logical and sequential and organized, starting with patho and how patho influences labs versus manifestations, et cetera. And so you can do two things. Use this as an educator to help organize your content differently. And if you're already in the membership, this is under classroom tools. Simply go to Classroom Tools and you will see Transform My Lecture Template. Use it for yourself, but this is the other principle. How about using a document like this as a ticket to class? That you've got 10 categories here. Why couldn't your students, why couldn't you post this Word document a week ahead of time, have them do one, two, and three? Patho? most important labs and clinical manifestations. And then you highlight in class as they bring their ticket to class to document that they basically came prepared. And that's another Facebook Live topic we're gonna talk about in the future, how to get your students to come to class prepared. Well, a short answer is a ticket, just like coming to a, going to a movie theater like we used to back in the day. You had to have a ticket. Uh, we can kind of raise that bar. That's a different discussion. But you know what? Think about your students can dig in the textbook and get a little bit of the information you're going to share next week on their own. They're adult learners, and they value asynchronous learning, by the way. They like it when they can do some things on their own. So just want to give you a vision for that. Use it for yourself. 
let your students build their lecture, portions of it. You choose. Have some fun. And again, this is a Word document that's, again, inside my membership for nurse educators. So I just wanted to kind of share that with you and let you know that that's a resource that um, you can have uh, that's available to you. So let me just kind of pull this away here and let me go back here. And, you know, in closing, you know, as we look at what the pandemic has done in nursing education, you know, I believe it's a positive thing. Because you know what this has forced us to do as educators that we don't like doing? It's forced us to change. It's forced us to do things differently. And, you know, I want to encourage you, you know, one of our, as I was reviewing for my comprehensive exams today, I was reviewing the competencies of a nurse educator. Did you know that in the, the National League of Nursing, the competencies for nurse educator number five is that the nurse educator functions as a change agent and a leader. And, you know, we struggle with change, but you know what? It's my passion to empower you all as educators to implement the needed change. And we need to embrace it. Change is not optional. It is upon us. And we're going to be forced to continue to evolve and change in our profession. And, you know, the subtitle to the NLS competency is this. We change and we function as a change agent to create a preferred future for nursing education and nursing practice. We want a better world. We need to prepare our students for practice. And right now we're struggling. The majority of our students do not graduate practice ready in the clinical judgment required despite passing the NCLEX. And so, you know, let's not let this opportunity pass us by. You know, and every one of you are leaders. You know, we're called to be as nurse educators. That's who we are. And whether you have a formal position of leadership or you're in that role unofficially because your students are looking up to you, faculty, colleagues, by implementing change, you can role model and be the needed change that we desperately need right now in nursing education. And so as I look at just, you know, some of the thoughts, I just want you to know that you know, I've got resources available. I've got a website yeah, at keithrn.com. I developed that eight years ago when I spoke at my first conference and it's grown. It's got about 30 case studies that included the HIV skinny reasoning and multiple other topics, but I've got free resources. I want you to download. I've got a case study on COVID-19 on the homepage. I've got free resources. If you scroll a little further down, some of the handouts that you can use as tickets to class and I'll talk about those in future in, in, in future Facebook Live. So be sure to check out KeithRN.com and grab some stuff. There's a lot of information I want to share and empower you with. And so I've got a little homework for you. I want you to review your PowerPoints again. And I want you to know, you know, what needs to be cut. I really want you to embrace that you can. You can eliminate infobesity. You can put your content on a needed diet. Paula did it with immunity and HIV. And if she can do it in that content, I know that you can do it as well. And so as we look at this, I just want you to know that as you look at uh, supportive community and really implementing change, you can't do it alone. You need colleagues in your department to partner with. And you know what? I've got a Facebook group called Teachers Transforming Nursing Education. It's a closed group, but it's over 5,000 educators from around the world and the United States supporting each other, asking any question relating to transforming your classroom and content. And if you're not already a member, please, uh, that should be another thing I'd love to see you do and get the support of so many educators who can come alongside you to be part of the needed change in nursing education. And so as we just kind of close this out, I'm looking at my Facebook feed and I'm looking for your questions. And I'm just kind of, I, I want to know what you are, what's kind of keeping you awake at night as you have hopefully looked at your classroom content because you want to teach the same online. You don't want to give infobesity just because you can post it. You can give your students 50, 60 minutes to look at the same, you know, to kind of have that info beast lecture. We still want to be a funnel. We want a deep learning of what's most important and make that a priority. And so I'm just kind of would like to know what your questions are as you look at uh, the next step and uh, what you're going to do moving forward from here. 
And so I'm kind of looking at, uh, I'm going to just highlight some questions here. It's got, I've got a question from Bailey who says in my foundations class, foundational care of the integumentary system is a huge undertaking for a one hour lecture. I've tried to focus on assessment, care and management of pressure ulcers. I get worried that I don't cover enough of the other content. How would your other educators tackle this? And again, you know, that's a great question, Bailey. And you know what, I will let other educators answer that in the, in the chat, but I would basically say this, Bailey, you know, what is most important? You know, our students are adult learners who can read. And so can we identify some of the priorities? You know, we're teaching assessment. And again, we wanna focus on what's most important, but again, deep knowledge of what is most important and what that looks like um, as, a, uh, as a first year generalist. And what can we kind of give our students to come to class prepared? Can we give them some of the content so that they have interacted with it, kind of like that transform your lecture template. You could, in essence, can you have them provide a guide for them to come to class prepared? So you're not feeling obligated to cover the content, which as we talked about in the past, puts a lid and they can't see what's most and least important. So just uh, some thoughts there, but uh, we'd just like you to share that. Um, and so other than that, um, I'm just kind of looking down here. Um, how do you handle students? Let's kind of put this up there. Um, I, how do you handle students who are unprepared and not participating to questions? Um, that's a really good question, Mary Ellen. The bottom line is, is that, as you know, is that you want to raise the bar of classroom preparation. You want your students to, in essence, come to class prepared and if you don't raise that bar, they'll come to class just as they are. So what can you do differently to raise that bar, to help them to see the value of the classroom? And in essence, again, take ownership for some of their learning. So they're coming to class with in essence, a, um, an ability to, that they've interacted with the material and they can contribute. They have come with some basic knowledge and laid that foundation. And again, um, that's kind of what I would, uh, how I would kind of approach that in principle. Um, and I'm just kind of looking at this quote here, this comment by Deb, important to give the most important information, but if you don't make it or refer to it, then most students don't do the option. And again, I, I, I'm not quite sure the, the verbiage there, Deb, but what I would, I, what I would communicate is that when we communicate what's most important, they know what to focus on. I know for myself as a PhD doctoral student, when they say read the entire chapter and this chapter and this chapter, and don't really identify what's most and least important in that content, I struggle to really make sense of brand new content. And your nursing students who are undergrads, the same principle applies. So you're kind of highlighting that for them and what that looks like. Um, and let me just kind of, I'm just kind of, I'm going to show this comment here, just part of it here, Julie. It says, I teach fundamentals near the end of the semester. My co-teacher, I need to teach some med surge topics. This is a big shock for my students. Any ideas on how I can, oh, I lost it here. How many ideas, how I can, how I can make this transition a little bit smoother. Well, as you look at med surge, that's really foundational content and your students are going to struggle with that. But again, we can help them by focusing on what is most and least important in that content, bringing a practice-based perspective. And so again, if we can decrease the content load, Julie, I guess it would be my hope that you could in essence, um, you know, recognize again, giving your students ownership for some of the learning. If you're identifying the path for them, not just saying read the chapter, but you're saying, here's three content areas I want you to put in your own words, the pathophysiology of this concept, the lab values most relevant, and the manifestations and how that's connected. How are those related to each other? You come with that to class and you've developed a simple document that they can, that you've posted. And again, give them back some of the ownership. I think that sometimes like I've shared in the past, we put a bigger burden on ourselves 
then we should. That yes, we have to teach well, but they have a responsibility to learn. And so just a thought um, as we look at that topic, um, I'm gonna just, uh, there's a lot, of, this was a, I'm just kind of, I'm gonna scroll to the bottom and work my way up here. Um, okay, so De Joyce has been asking some questions here. What about students who give totally wrong answers? Identified sinus Brady versus B B Tech in a previous post, give a good explanation of medical management of VTAC, but totally unrelated to scenario. Students who said sinus bradyia could cause a stroke. Well, you know, in those contexts, Joyce, you've just got wrong information. The question is, why are they getting it wrong? And so again, we need to ask the why questions. When we see our students struggling with content or they're not getting it, why? Why? And where are they missing it? And I think that's where we just need to take time as an educator to facilitate that process and have that dialogue, even in the classroom. When we're asking questions in our classroom and our students aren't getting it, we can ask the why question. Like, our, may our classrooms be a safe place to ask questions? And so again, um, just a thought uh, for you to consider. And so I've got a question from Tonya. Uh, do you, so do you teach the content more of what is on the test? That's a great question, Tonya. And what I would say is this, we wanna focus on what is most important for the class, you know, for our classroom. We're, we're highlighting, we're shining a light on that chapter or that reading of whatever it is that we're teaching. So we, in our lecture, are highlighting what's most important. And I would say in principle, 75 to 80% of your test should be on your lecture that highlights what is need to know and understood by your students. Let the 20, 25% that you didn't cover well or that's in the textbook, let them read that. Hold them accountable for the information that you want them to know related to your SLOs. But again, emphasize your evaluation on what really is most important and that you're highlighting for them in your classroom lecture. So I hope you found that helpful. And again, if any of you have further questions, just email me at Keith, K-E-I-T-H, at KeithRN.com. And I'll reply as soon as I'm able, usually within 24 hours, if not sooner. So if I didn't cover your question and it's still keeping you up at night, email me and I'd be glad to help you. Um, and yeah, so Peggy, you know, this is a great question. Peggy is saying, you know, how do you get your students to come to class? I want to share the strategies of what other educators are doing. I use a participation grade. Part of it is attendance, the other part is being prepared. So Peggy, I'm assuming you have that in your syllabus because that's your contract with students. And if it, I'm assuming that it is, you know what, you're covered as a faculty, you can basically raise that bar. And I would encourage as we look at some of these changes and things that I'm sharing with you, if they're resonating with you, classroom preparation, deep knowledge of what's most important, we can't do it in a silo. We must do it together where all of us in the department are on the same page. And so this is where leadership needs to come in and needs to really uh, come alongside and to really strengthen um, what we're doing and how we're doing it. And so really just want to encourage you all to get on the same page. We have too many silos in our departments. You know, our different levels live in silos and even in, silo, even in the departments, uh, in the different content and teams, we can live in silos. And that needs to change. We need to have some good open dialogue and collaboration and have that respect, civility, and being able to discuss these differences and really get on the same page of what is best practice. And again, just like clinical best practice, educational best practice should not be optional. It doesn't come under the umbrella of academic freedom. This is the train. This is the ship we're on, and we're burning the ships of content-heavy, lecture-only classrooms. Pat Benner said 10 years ago, we need to burn that ship. That's not helping our students think like a nurse. And so we can change, and we can transform the way we teach and do things differently. Um, so yes, um, I have a class right. I have a question here I'm going to put on the screen. Um, this is from Bailey, and Bailey said, I like the ticket to class idea, but we have 200 students. 
split into two classes. Um, Bailey, that's a, that, that could be a potential problem as far as managing 200 tickets. Um, that could be managed though if you have uh, a, a tech, you know, a, an LMS that you could integrate your ticket into that they have to submit and somehow there's some recording. I don't know if that's possible, but I totally agree that without that, it's a lot of extra work. Um, but at the same time, you know, be creative and think about, you know, you don't necessarily, you're kind of raising the bar. And if you're doing small group work and small group activities and they're not participating, they're not knowledgeable, um, the bottom line is, is that they're going to struggle. And uh, the bottom line is, is that they're going to be kind of in a small group. They're not going to be respected or valued. They're going to look bad to their peers. Uh, and so the bottom line is sometimes just positive peer pressure. Uh, you don't have to really, you know, you can just have that kind of uh, culture where, you know, the students are going to call others out if they're not prepared. They did the work, but you didn't. It's not okay. You know, you should kind of have a healthy culture where that can be communicated respectfully student to student. And they'll come to class prepared more next time because of that positive peer pressure that can help raise the bar. Um, boy, this is a great question. I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to, this is worth showing. Peggy says this, we may want to burn that ship, again, of classroom heavy content load, but the students only want lecture. What do you do? What's really interesting is that your students are adult learners. And as adult learners, because of the stress of nursing education, I think many of them regress to being toddlers and want to be spoon fed. And this is where we as educators can again encourage our students that adult learning theory, really they want small group work, active learning that's relevant and real world practice and there's problems to be solved. That's adult learning theory in a nutshell, according to Malcolm Nowells. Reviewed that for my comps as well. <laughs> and the bottom line is, is that your students are adults. And those principles still apply. And so we need to kind of, again, raise that bar and hold the bar. Don't bring it down to that level that they want, high but realistic. And that's an adult learning bar. So again, they're stressed because they want to pass the test. But we as educators, this is what I would kind of encourage us all to look at. Sometimes we have to look inward. Sometimes we're part of the problem because we're giving our students so much information, they're stressed out. Now it's a difficult major, but let's balance it. Let's kind of look at, again, are we part of the problem? Because many times we, sometimes we can be. And let's just authentically reflect and let's not continue that pattern if we can help our students get the deep knowledge of what's most important. And so, yes, you know, that would just basically, again, we, we don't give students what they want. We give them what they need. And that's meaningful active learning that's going to help them apply the knowledge and what that looks like. And we'll discuss that next week and talk about that and what that would look like. So I uh, just want you to kind of consider that and take this kind of one step at a time. Um, and so I'm just kind of looking at other questions that we got some things counting. We got some great kind of I, I really value the opportunity with this to facilitate some of the faculty dialogue. As you look at kind of what you're doing, it says like uh, in this con in this uh, by uh, oh, I'm just kind of looking at some of the things here is that you, you, you're, you've got some great feedback of just kind of helping each other out here and what that looks like. And um, how you, yes, you did put in the syllabus. I see that and uh, what that looks like. And I'm just kind of looking to see if we've got some other questions that are still coming. Um, yes, and so, you know, Vicki has a great question here. I tell my fundamental students in their orientation what the expectations for class and explain that I use a scrambled method of teaching. Now, Vicki, for those who may not be familiar, scrambled class is kind of what I advocate and Donna Iggy and others advocate a 50-50, kind of a balanced 20, 25 minutes of lecture and then scramble it with a active learning application, whether it be a case study or other principle. And so as you look at this, I, 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 we need to communicate the expectations and why. 
that again, we're preparing you for practice. When you look at why active learning, why deep learning of most important, and then why are we gonna make time for active application? It's because nursing at the end of the day, it's all about the patient improving their outcomes because you're the nurse responsible. You hold their life in their hands. And so we need to bring practice into our classroom, bring clinical to class because it's all about the patient and improving their outcomes. And if we don't make learning active, it's not about the content. It's not about the test. It's about the patient. And I think that's a paradigm shift in general that in nursing education, we've lost sight of. We've really made so much focus on the NCLEX and passing the NCLEX and what's our pass rates. Those are all important, but are we preparing them and making practice preparation an equal priority? That's an honest question every one of you need to ask yourself, because I think we're struggling from what I see from my perspective. So again, Vicki, I love that comment, communicating expectations and what that looks like. and. Um, and so, um, and so I'm, I'm gonna, Joyce has got a great question here, a great insight that I think is worth sharing. It says, the students are quick enough to tell us they're adult learners when it suits them, not when we try to make them responsible for learning. Then they complain they have to teach themselves. And you know, what's really funny about that, that students honestly say that all over the country, that active learning, I'm just teaching myself. So I'm paying you to teach me and I'm doing it myself. That's a lie. And we're going to kind of go and, and next week kind of talk about some, some principles. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do next week. I've got some thoughts. I'll, maybe I shouldn't go there quite yet. But in the very near future, in the next week or two, we're going to really drill deep on now active learning, some very practical strategies and different strategies to bring the application to our classroom. Because I, I really wanted us to understand why we need to cut the load, how we can do it, but now we've got to bring active into our online or our traditional classrooms. And so that's basically what we're going to do um, in the next week or two. So I want you to come back. And if you can't make it again, the link will be waiting for you. Um, so I'm going to be wrapping this up shortly. Um, but I do see a couple a couple comments here. I'm just going to see what, uh, what Lynn had to say here. She said, I often start with an experiment or an activity, and then go to the PowerPoint slides to reinforce the activity. That seems to solidify the material and opens the dialogue for lots of input. You know, Lynn, that's a great idea. And again, this is where your creativity as an educator can shine through. You know, I, I kind of, you know, this is, you know, you can do the activity before, you can do it after. I kind of just, and especially if you're giving them more information to kind of prepare for, make them review some key aspects of the content. Then they're coming to class prepared to just immediately engage with the active learning. And I love that, Lynn. So again, I love the dialogue of just kind of having uh, all of us contribute to the discussion because we can grow and learn from each other. I'm just one voice. I just happen to have the camera but I've got others here that are dialoguing and chatting and I love the interaction here. And I wanna highlight those that really are contributing to the discussion as, as they, I'm, I've got so many here, I may have missed some, so I apologize for that. But in principle, um, I think we've kind of covered the tracks here. And you know what? I hope you found this helpful, giving you some ideas to, in essence, uh, get the wheel spinning. You know, my goal is just to kind of give you enough information to in essence, get started uh, to move forward. You know, it's kind of like a parked car. You know, a parked car, it's really hard to move a car when it's totally parked, you can't steer it. But if that parked car is moving, even a couple, three miles an hour, you can steer it to the right or to the left quite easily. And we wanna go in the right direction of transformation of nursing education and what that looks like. And so anyways, I wanna thank you all again. You guys are rock stars and it's my pleasure to support you as you do what you can to transform the way you teach to better prepare your students for practice and licensure. Thanks so much. I look forward to seeing you next Thursday at 8 p.m. Have a great week. Blessings to you all.